بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولهما بعد uh, Today and tomorrow inshallah we will be doing a brief primer on the fiqh of zakah and that is because uh, it is essential as you know to give our zakah once a year and most of us choose to do it in Ramadan and I get always questions asked about zakah so there has been a demand to talk about the fiqh of zakah so that we give our zakah properly realize my dear brothers and sisters as we are all aware that zakah is one of the fundamental pillars of our religion it is mentioned in the Quran combined with salah more than 30 times they are paired together praying and giving charity are paired together more than 30 times and in fact as you all are aware that after the death of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam groups of tribes they decided we don't want to give zakah and Abu Bakr as Siddiq declared that those groups who refuse to give zakah cannot be considered Muslims. So he considered zakah to be a fundamental pillar such that somebody who said, I don't have to give zakah, and he denies that he has to give zakah, this person, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the Sahaba, they consider to be outside the fold of Islam. And therefore zakah is of the fundamental pillars as in the famous hadith of Jibreel when he was asked about the five pillars. So we know that one of those pillars was in fact the zakah. And zakah is not an income tax, but rather a savings tax. And the word zakah means to purify. The one who purified the soul has been successful. And from the word purification, we understand the goal of zakah. Zakah is not meant to be a burden on us. Zakat is meant to purify our wealth for us. It's as if our wealth is not good, it's unhealthy, it is gonna harm us. When we give zakah, then our wealth becomes pure for us to consume. And also one of the meanings of zakah is to become blessed and so to, to grow. So when we give zakah, the money has barakah, the money actually grows more. And that's why we are told that when we give zakah, our money does not go down, it actually increases. And Allah Azza wa Jal commands the Prophet Sallallahu Take from their money their sadaqah. Take from their wealth their charity. That charity, Allah says, تُطَهِّرُهُمْ بِهَا That charity will purify them وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ And it will cleanse them of their sins. So in the Quran, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is commanded, you have to collect their zakah, and when you collect their zakah, they will become pure, and that money will become good for them, and it will purify them. As well, of course, zakah makes us think of those who are less fortunate than us, because when we give zakah, we have to find out who is going to take that zakah. So we have to go looking around, who are the people that deserve that zakah? And in that search, our hearts should soften. When we find people who are deserving of zakah, we are aware of the blessings on us. We are aware that our religion tells us to take care of those that are neglected, of the widows, of the orphans. So we become sympathetic and we then freely give unto others. And of course, zakah not only purifies our wealth, it also purifies us from stinginess, from miserliness, from greed, from conceit. So when we give to others, we become better people. And that is why zakah is an obligation upon us. Who gives zakah? Every single Muslim who owns more than the technical term is the nisab and one Islamic year has gone by. So every Muslim who owns more than the bare minimum that the sharia has specified and one year has gone by, they have to give zakah. And realize that there are three types of charities in the Quran. There is zakah and the hadith mentions zakat al-fitr number two and then there is sadaqah. And the difference is actually very straightforward. Zakat is the annual charity that we're talking about in this uh, khatir today. Zakat al-Fitr is the charity that is due for Ramadan only. It is obligatory and only for Ramadan and I'll talk about that towards the end of this month and it is a nominal amount, 7 or $10 per person depending on how you extract the, the calculation from the amount of wheat. It's a small amount, once a year Zakat al-Fitr, that's in Ramadan for our, uh, for our fasting. And then the third category is general sadaqah, just to give charity above and beyond zakah that's not obligatory 
sorry, but the more that you give, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give back to us. Our lecture today is about the first category, which is the obligatory zakah. What are we required to give? So what wealth is zakatable? This is an English Arabic word that is now common. It's actually going to enter the dictionary soon, inshallah, because people are using it all the time. Zakatable. What wealth is zakatable? Which wealth do you calculate your zakat from? There are five categories, and we will only go into detail for the first two of them. The other three we'll just mention and then move on. The first category, which is the main category, is gold and silver and by extension currencies. So the number one category, you give zakat on gold and silver and by extension, the modern currencies. And so bank accounts, stocks, money held in retirement funds, this is category one, which is basically our cash and all that is derived from that. Number two, business commodities. This will only apply if you run and operate a business. If you are a salaried employee who does not have any business, then this will not apply to you. But if you own a company, or if you own a buying and selling a trades, if you own a gas station, if you own a furniture store, then this is the second category that is business zakat. And this is basically commodities of business, items that a merchant will buy and sell. And we'll go into a little bit of detail about that as well tomorrow as well. The third category, which we will not discuss, but you should be aware of, is livestock. If you own certain quantities of animals, and all of these quantities are more than a small amount. So if you own a chicken in your backyard, that's not zakat. But if you own you know, many camels, many goats, and each uh, category of animals has a different number, so there is zakat due on livestock. And the fourth category is zakat on agricultural produce if you are a farmer. We're not talking about your tomatoes in your backyard. We're talking about if you own acres and acres of farmland and you are a farmer, then there's zakat on the produce. And the fifth and final category, this is zakat on, it, the Arabic word is rikaz. And rikaz is translated as treasure trove. So if you own some land and you come across some uh, treasure that is buried there, or in our times, many fuqaha say, if you discover an oil field in the backyard, firstly, call me up and we'll be good friends, inshallah, after that. But uh, secondly, there's an issue of zakat on natural resources in your land. This is ar-rikaz. So category three, four, and five, uh, frankly, I wouldn't even know off the top of my head. I memorized the charts of uh, livestock back when I was a second year undergraduate in Medina. Since then, I've never once even looked at that chart. How much zakat on how many camels and how many uh, cows and sheep I have totally forgotten but in case you own 77 sheep come to me and I'll look it up for you but otherwise there's no need to go into the livestock or the agriculture we are interested in the first two categories and that is gold and silver and currencies and then obviously business commodities the technical stuff I'll delay for tomorrow because there is some technical stuff what is the uh, zakat on your own personal items by unanimous consensus of all the scholars of Islam there is no zakat on the items that you use to live your life for example the house that you live in for example the cars that you drive for example the clothes that you wear the food in your house there is no zakat you simply do not look at that for calculation the only issue of controversy is that of gold and silver jewelry that is owned by the women uh, I hope the men don't own any gold jewelry. They shouldn't be owning any gold jewelry. But gold and silver, that is the only exception. And by the way, I mean gold and silver. If a lady has platinum or diamonds or whatnot, there is no zakat on that for her jewelry. There is no zakat on that. It's only on gold and silver jewelry. This is where our classical scholars have differed. Does gold and silver jewelry constitute currency, in which case there will be zakat, or does it constitute household items, in which case there is no zakat, and we'll get to this controversy uh, in a while, inshallah ta'ala. So what is the bare minimum? What is the nisab amount? The sharia came with quantities of gold and silver, and the hadith mentions basically the equivalent of three ounces of gold or 21 ounces of silver. Now in those days, three ounces of gold and 21 ounces of silver was the equivalent, that was the exchange rate. Well, 1,440 years have gone by since then. These days, three ounces of gold is around $4,000. 21 ounces of silver is around $400. So the thing has changed immensely, the exchange rate. So the bottom line is that pretty much every person living in this land will have more than three, four hundred dollars especially if they have any type of job, then essentially is zakat is obligatory on any Muslim uh, living in this land.
Now the issue of zakat on gold and silver, uh, really we can give many, many lectures. I'm sure our sheikh can give us hours of uh, evidences on both sides. In a nutshell, the Hanafi school of law says that zakat is obligatory on female jewelry, gold and silver. If you own gold and silver, it is obligatory on them. And this is actually the position of many uh, non-Hanafi scholars of our times as well, because the ahadith seem to be very explicit here. But the other three madhabs, the Hanbalis, the Shafi'is, and the Malikis, they say, generally speaking, the personal jewelry that is owned by women, it constitutes the same as the clothes and the garments and the household items, so it will be excluded from zakah. So if you follow one of the four madhabs, I've given you uh, uh, the four madhabs. If you ask me what my personal position is, even though I'm generally a Hanbali, but in this issue, I think the texts are very explicit and the ahadith are very explicit. The Prophet entered upon Umm Salama and she was wearing some jewelry and she asked, did you give zakat on this or did you give your charity on this? So Allah knows best, but the position of most of my own teachers, even though they're not Hanafi, most of my own teachers that actually follow the Hanafi position in this regard and it is my own also household thing that we give zakat on the jewelry in the house because of the explicit nature. But again, this is only the gold and silver jewelry, not the jewelry that is non-gold and silver. Who do we give zakat to? Zakat is given by explicit text of the Quran to eight categories. This is mentioned in Surah At-Tawbah. إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ And eight categories are mentioned. And for our purposes, the first two are the most relevant. The others are either impossible or difficult for us to do. For example, one of the eight categories is freeing slaves. No longer there. One of the eight categories is uh, that those that are in legitimate debts, and there's a long list of criteria in what constitutes a legitimate debt. One of the eight categories is the traveler who is away from his land. He doesn't have access to his wealth. He might be wealthy in his land, but by the time he reaches your land, he doesn't have wealth. Well, in our times, because of bank accounts, credit cards, again, that's very, very rare. So realistically speaking, for example, one of the eight categories, those non-Muslims who we want to give zakat to, that their hearts become soft towards Islam. The Arabic is مُؤَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ Our Prophet would give zakat, and by the way, of the eight categories, this is the only category that you can give zakat to a non-Muslim. Otherwise, the other seven categories must be Muslim. The one exception, when the Islamic ruler decides that so-and-so, we need to soften his animosity towards Islam, and that is done by money. And it is authentically known in the seerah that after the battle of Tabuk and Hunayn, our Prophet gave large quantities of zakah to specific tribal chieftains who might have attacked Islam, who might have harmed Islam, but by giving them that wealth, essentially the Muslims were protected. Well, that category, me and you don't decide. It is the ruler. It is the uh, Khalifa that does that. So for our purposes, really, what we are down to is essentially uh, al-fuqara'i wal-masakeen, faqir and miskeen. What is the difference between faqir and miskeen? Majority of scholars say the faqir is the one that he doesn't own anything. He's like the street beggar. And the miskeen is the one he might own stuff. He might even have more than the nisab. But it's not enough for him to live a, a life that is comfortable for the average human being of your society. And so faqir is basically, let's say the homeless person, the street beggar, he has nothing. And the miskeen might have a house. He might have a car he's driving, but he's in debt. And he cannot pay the bills for his family, even though maybe he has furniture that is more than the nisab. If he had to sell, he would, but he doesn't have enough to live a regular life of a person of your background and culture. Like for example, in America, what is the poverty line? So this is the miskeen, and the miskeen is worthy of zakat. So this is the main category that we will give zakat to, and zakat cannot be given to blood relatives that depend on us for for uh, risk. For example, uh, uh, the wife or the children, or the, uh, or the uh, parents. They cannot be given zakah because you must take care of them. However, they can be given to extended family. And so in most circumstances, not all, in most circumstances, you can give zakah to, let's say, sisters and brothers. Definitely you can give zakah to cousins and uncles and aunts. Definitely you can give zakah to extended family. And in fact, giving zakah to extended family, if they deserve it, obviously, if they're or miskeen, giving zakat to them is more rewarded than giving zakat elsewhere. As well, our scholars say zakat should begin locally, but it is okay to send to other places as well. So 
many of our teachers taught us that we should divide zakat into three categories. This is not fiqh, this is just adab. One third should be local, and one third may be relatives in another land, and one third to causes that are zakat illegible. This is just a, a, a rule of thumb, it's nothing from the fiqh, it's just basically an, uh, um, uh, to, to diversify your zakat investment in the eyes of Allah, that you should. But in the end of the day, if you have a distant cousin who is genuinely, uh, let's say she's widowed, she has children, she's in a desperate situation, she's your cousin, you may give all of your zakat to that person and that is completely fine. But our scholars say if you're able to, then you should diversify so that you get multiple reward. As well, you do not have to tell the recipient that you are giving zakat. You may say, oh, this is a gift. And in your heart, you have the niyyah of zakat. However, for it to be zakat, you must have the niyyah before you give. Suppose you give somebody a gift. Then the next day say, oh, I actually owe zakah. Let me make that a zakah too late. It must be given. The niya has to be in your heart before you give the uh, zakah. And according to the strongest opinion, and this is hotly debated in our times. In our times, many ulama are having intellectual debates over this issue. I myself am deeply involved in this. But still, the majority opinion is that zakat is given to individuals and not institutions. Zakat is given to individuals who need it and not to institutions. Now, I personally follow the position that only some institutions we can give zakat to. Don't just make it open to any institution. If the institution is, let's say, an orphanage, let's say. In this case, maybe, inshallah, it is permissible to give zakat uh, because it is an orphanage. You're building an orphan for the, for, the, uh, for, the, for the people who need it. Otherwise, believe it or not, the majority of scholars historically have said zakat should not be given even to building an orphanage. They said zakat is given to human beings, not to institutions. In our times, many ulama are debating this issue they're looking at the world and how how difficult it is to live and they're saying institutions that serve a public good for the muslim community they may be given zakah. My position is kind of in the middle, case by case basis. We look at the institution, we see what it is doing. So for example, just a generic hospital it's problematic in my opinion to give zakah because not everybody who is treated is poor. If it's treating for free, maybe a rich person will come. That's not mustahiq al zakah. But suppose, theoretically, you could guarantee that everybody being treated was a poor person. In my humble opinion, in this case, you can give zakah to such an institution. But the point is, this is an area of controversy. The majority of scholars say zakah is given to individuals. Inshallah, this is part one. Tomorrow, we'll get to the technical stuff of stocks and mutual funds and 401ks. And inshallah, then we'll go into more detail. Until then, jazakumullah khair, salam. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته